Deuteronomy chapter 3. Uh, a lot of things here in this particular section of the Word of God, what we call the Torah portion, uh, beginning in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. And here this weekend, Va'et Kanan uh, is the name of it. And it begins toward the end of chapter 3. And depending on what kind of Bible you have, if you have one similar to mine, it begins in verse number 23. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to that. If not, don't worry about it. Just listen. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse number 23. We'll just go ahead and get started there. Deuteronomy uh, 3.23. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your words of life and peace and instruction and direction. Please help us to understand them. Help us to walk after them. Help us to learn them and get uh, a picture of what you, you've said to us here. Help us, Lord God, to be of sound mind and sound doctrine. Give us ears to hear. Help us to be hearers and doers of your wonderful words and promises. In Messiah Yeshua's name, amen. 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 Here in the Word of God, I'm just going to go ahead and start reading here in the book of Deuteronomy 3.23. Then I pleaded with Yudhebave at that time, saying, Adonai, Yudhebave, you've begun to show your servants your greatness and your mighty hand. For what mighty one is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. But good Abah, they was angry with me on your account, would not listen to me. So good Abah, they said to me, enough of that, speak no more to me of this matter. Now, someone said that God always answers our prayers, but sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no, and uh, it could even be, at times, this may be one of the answers. Uh, don't speak to me more about this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that kind of an answer, but uh, we hear Moses pray, and he gets that kind of an answer. Uh, don't you ever speak to me about this again. Uh, verse 27, go up to the top of this God, this ridge, and lift up your eyes toward the west. The north, the south, the east, beyond it with your eyes. For you shall not cross over this Jordan, but command Yehoshua, and encourage him and strengthen him, for he will go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land in which you will see. So we stayed in the valley opposite Beth Peor. Just want to make mention there's a lot of different things that can be said here in this Torah portion. And a lot, you know, we had a little discussion thing tonight, and, and some people really like that. Sometimes it's good to be able to ask questions, and uh, at, at times we, we've done that here on Shabbat mornings. One of the things that, that I believe this pictures, and a lot of different ideas here, this is just one idea, and you can, you're definitely uh, allowed to have your own ideas. Uh, uh, you know, this is just particular idea I want to throw out there. Moses, uh, it's believed within Jewish tradition, he had prayed quite a number of times. Does anybody know the traditional approximate amount of how many times he had petitioned God? If you've read this, it's been a while since I've read it. I need to refresh my mind. Uh, I think it was like over 500 times, I think, supposedly. How do they know that? Well, I don't know, but, but in, in some of the Jewish traditions and what they write, they believe that he had questioned God like over 500 times, asking him, please let me go. Mm. So, you know, I guess if you ask, you know, if you ever had a kid that's asked you repeatedly quite a few things, then after a certain number of times, you may give an answer like what God uh, gave to Moses here. Mm. Uh, that's enough of that. You know, I, I know I have a son that has a bad habit when we go on a trip. Are we there yet? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think he does it just for the fun of it. You know, we just left. I mean, literally two minutes down the road. Are we there yet? Uh, so he does it just for fun, but, uh, you know, we probably heard that. My father 
this, and again, it's just my thought, but, but Moses represents the, our strength. Moses was a strong man who lived to be 120 years old. Mm -hmm. Even at that age, he, he, he uh, had good eyesight, and just everything was good about him. It was just his time. Mm -hmm. He represents our human fleshly strength, our ability to try to keep God's ways. He represents uh, what we want to call it the law, the law of Moses, as sometimes it's called. So the law of Moses points us to Messiah. It points us to the promised land, but it will not get us there. Mm. Notice how he words this. Now, he, you can see it. He said, Moses got to see it through the word of God, including the, uh, what we, uh, if you were here last night, the old, uh, 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 some said, oh, well, you know, all you do is study the old, the Torah, the prophets, the Tanakh, through all of that, we see a picture that God, we see salvation. We see it pointing us to Messiah, to the promised land. Here, I'm going to read again, verse 28, but command Yehoshua and encourage them to strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which he will seek. Really, he points to Messiah. Only through Messiah can we really get to that place and really receive uh, what God has. He's the door. He's the way. He's the truth. So, uh, in regard to that, I'm going to say quite a bit more. Uh, but, but we don't get saved by law keeping. Our salvation isn't in our ability to keep God's laws. And most Messianics agree with that uh, that concept. Most believers uh, believe in that kind of a concept. And we're not saved by our ability, our strength. And really, I mean, this is part of the picture of that. Uh, God said he will not enter into the land. We know exactly why. Because he didn't become angry. He, he did uh, create an act of disobedience when he hit the rock twice. He spoke some words. Uh, he didn't spoke words God told him not to speak. He hit the rock and God told him not to hit the rock. We'll be studying that a few weeks back. We kind of look at a lot of different ideas about what exactly caused that place where he wasn't going to enter. You know, there are different ideas about uh, it, it all stems from something in his heart, you know, that, that happened. And, and there was a combination, possibly, of things. It wasn't just the idea of hitting the rock. It was more than just that. It was some of the words that he said and, and how he said them. And so if you were here at that particular spot, you remember we talked a little bit in detail about that. So as I get started here, the idea is, and it's important for us to have that foundation, that our foundation is on the grace of God. Because it's important that we know who we are in our heart. I was watching a documentary, and I don't know how I got into this. Sometimes I watch really weird stuff. It's something that I have to be careful of. But uh, I saw a documentary, and uh, we live in a messed up society. I saw a picture uh, of a young person. I don't know how old they were, 9 or 10. It looked like a, a, a just a beautiful young child. It was a young lady, supposedly. And uh, this young lady was born as a boy. But at the age of three or four, kept dressing like a girl. And so uh, eventually they just let the kid dress like a girl all the time. Let the kid uh, grow his hair out. And it looked like a girl. And so uh, later, the kid was having some real identity problems. Because the kid was like, the mom was like, well, who are you really? Are you a boy or are you a girl? And so uh, they had problems at school. And, and it was all, I believe it was demonic when you really looked at the whole pattern of everything. And finally when they, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go into great detail, but I'm saying part of that to say this, that it wasn't the outside issue that it started, but it was in the inside issue. And when we get it right in here, then everything's going to fall into place. And so, you know, when we, we have our heart right with God, when we have our heart right and we are righteous through faith in Messiah, then everything's going to follow accordingly. And so it starts from the inside out. And in order to be righteous with God, it has to start from the inside out. In order to be holy with God, it starts from the inside out. You know, the religious people of Yeshua's day, they were pretty holy on the outside. But he saw them on the inside. He saw their hearts. And he said, you know, uh, you know, it, 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 maybe it's great that they try to look so holy, but they ain't so holy in here. And so uh, it, it needs to be both. It needs to be both. Years ago, many years ago, in my life, we visited what's called Holiness Pentecostal Churches. 
And in some aspects, I miss the spirit of what they had there. Because that they were they were hungry for holiness. They wanted to live holy. And they wanted to stay set apart for God. And they did it in certain ways. And those of you that are familiar, and there's not as many here, uh, when me and my wife got up and renewed us, we, we moved to Nacogdoches for a couple of years, and we helped the congregation out there, and then God moved us here. We've been here about a little over nine years. Out of the Nacogdoches area, in the East Texas area, a lot of these holiness and false black people, a lot of them. And so they're very zealous, they're very emotional, they feel like that's holy, the women, long hair, no makeup, no jewelry, that kind of a thing. Uh, you know, even the wedding band is considered to be jewelry. And so uh, they consider that to be holy. And so there's certain things, you know, I saw the heart, though, in what they were trying to do. And it was a beautiful thing that they were trying to be holy, they were trying to be distinct for God. They were trying to not be worldly. And so those things are great. But if their heart's not right, then it means nothing. And how many of you have seen that where people you thought, oh, that must be a really holy person. And then maybe you got to know them. And you got to see how they really were. And then maybe just the opposite is true. Maybe you saw someone and you thought, oh my gosh, who did that? That person looks creepy or that person looks like a real wild child. But then you saw the, their heart and you thought, that's actually a really good person. That's really a, they seem to be a really nice person. How many of you saw the movie Mom's? Day out or long shot out. Anybody see that movie? Uh, somehow I saw it. It's a really good flick. It's, really uh, it's a comedy. Uh, it's kind of a faith based film. And in the film, you've got these bikers. And one's a real rough looking guy. and uh, But he ends up being a very heartfelt guy that, that really gives some good words of encouragement to this one particular mother. And so, uh, you know, they, they kind of, you know, they, we, we just don't know who, who, who they are on the inside. Anyway, let me kind of get back here to a little bit of the Torah portion. He basically is saying, and I believe he's saying to us, and we even see this in Galatians, he that works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? By hearing of faith, that's the answer. He that, that uh, ministers the Spirit of God, receives the Spirit of God, does that happen by the hearing of the law? Are the works of the law by the hearing of faith? What well, it's by faith. And so he's not necessarily saying the law is bad, but he's saying to receive from God is by faith. And uh, to be saved, to be forgiven, it's by faith. You know, if you don't say, God, I'm trying to keep all of your laws, please forgive me now, put me into your kingdom. I'm not saying that that's a bad prayer to pray, but uh, Yeshua, Messiah, is the door, the way, the truth, and the life. If anybody tries to get in in any other way, the Bible says that they're, they're a thief, they're a robber, they're a Now, once we're in, things are a little bit different. He actually says here, once they're in the land, then there's all kind of things that they're to guide their lives by. And he repeats that. A lot of these laws that are here in this particular core portion in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, it all emphasizes over and over again the wording, in the land, you're to live in this particular way, that you may be protected, that you may be blessed, that you may be kept. Now, once we're saved, and, and this is just kind of a little bit of a picture, once we're saved, we don't just live however we want. Right. The additions, by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should vote. We are saved, though, as his workmanship unto good works, which we keep before our day that we should walk in them. Mm -hmm. So good works don't save us. Uh, I believe good works didn't keep it. Uh, God gave it. We, we, those of you who were here last week, we talked a little bit about studying some of the Hebrew words. God set that land in front of Israel and basically gave it to them and said, go get it. And so as they entered into the land and they obtained that which God provided, then he had some things, though. They didn't just go live however they wanted to. He had an established way for them to live. God does want us to live a certain way. And if we choose to live our way, then there are great consequences in that. Here, you know, Moses, it's unfortunate that he did not get to go over. The Bible says in James 3, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that he who is to teach will be judged with greater strictness. The greater positions of ministry means greater responsibility and greater accountability and, in many times, greater discipline. 
And so it's great being in a, a ministry position, but at the same time, though, uh, we have to be careful because uh, other people are listening. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Now Israel, listen. This word Shema, which can mean listen, understand, learn. It can also mean to obey. To the statute, to the kokim, to the rules, the mishpatim that I'm teaching you, and do them, that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that Yudhei Bame, the God of your fathers, has given you. Here he talks about the mitzvah, the mishpat, the kok, which many times it, it is, is spoken out of the word of God. I mean, Deuteronomy 4, look at verse 9. Deuteronomy 4, 9. Only take care, this word shamar again, and keep the word shamar, your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children, your children's children. Therefore you shall keep the word Shabbat, his statutes, his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, that you may prolong your days in the land that Adonai, your Elohim, has given you for all time. And again, this word Shabbat, as he's telling them, uh, can mean to listen, it can mean to understand and to obey. This word shamar, which he says, take care, shamar, and keep your soul diligently, shamar. It means to hedge about as with thorns, to guard it, to protect it, to attend to it, to keep it, to mark it, to observe it, to regard it. There to keep God's words and, and, to, and to be careful with the laws that God gave to his people in Israel. And, and, and these were a people that were slaves for hundreds of years. Mm. These were God's distinct people that he called the nation. He called them Israel as God's nation. Mm. And as he delivered them from Israel, from Egypt, to be his own people, he established a covenant with them. Mm. And so this covenant was a strong covenant. This covenant was a do or die covenant, if you really read it, in, in what it's saying. It said, basically, you obey, I'm going to keep you. You keep my words, I'll keep you. You obey, you'll be blessed. And we're not going to get into all the details. If you disobey, well, but that's, there's another thing coming. Mm -hmm. God loved his people, but they had to keep themselves set apart for him. They had to diligently observe all of the words of this uh, uh, covenant and everything that was there. And so it, it, it was something that was to keep them in line, to keep them in check. And they were to diligently teach each one, this is how we live. This is who you are. This is how we live. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with having rules and guidelines. Uh, it saves lives. I mean, it, it can be very helpful in all aspects of life, uh, in schools, in, in jobs, in, in uh, just anything. R rules can be very productive, very important. Uh, in, in political sense, in addition, you know, rules are important when they're the right kind of rules. Mm -hmm. Rules, though, can be a pain if you don't have the right heart for it. Mm -hmm. And so, even though we may have rules, if we don't have the right heart, those rules really won't really help us in a way. We may be doing it on the outside, but on the inside, we may be far from where we need to be. And sometimes I see people like that, whether they're obeying the Baptist rules, it calls the rules, I've got long hair, oh yeah, you're holy. Uh, the Messianic kind of the rules, you know, God's rules, uh, whatever it may be, you know, uh, a person you may meet may be keeping a lot of them on the outside, which is fine and great. But sometimes if their heart's far from God and they're not keeping them, then I wonder, are they really keeping them? Years ago, uh, I'm going to be careful how I say this. Uh, years ago, we, we knew a couple, and, and unfortunately, they, they've been married for many years, and they got separated. They used to be missionaries and, you know, on fire. They did a lot of things for God. But before they got married, like any young couples, they found themselves uh, kissing and doing other things. But they didn't go all the way. Uh, so they didn't actually commit adultery. Well, you know, sometimes we, we wonder, well, you know, they didn't actually step over that line. But what was in their heart, though? You know, in their heart, they
they way crossed that line. I was telling one of my sons the other day, and, and uh, this is for uh, any young people and any, even adults, uh, because, you know, they've got friends and different things. And I said, you know, I said, son, I want you to think about this. And I, I, uh, look at me. You know, you know who I am. I'm your dad. I'm a married man. I've been married uh, over 20 years. Happy to be My wife's actually not here this morning. She's out of town with the in-laws. So uh, that's why my family's not here. That'd be here. And I said, you know, son, if they like, I like, let's just say church. And I said, I came in here, and then I just looked around at all the girls and females, and I, I went up to each one, and I kissed each one. <laughs> I, I hugged each one. I, I held their hand, and I said, you think that'd be appropriate? No. And I said, well, why not? I said, well, I'm not in marriage covenant with them. And I, I said, so you need to watch yourself. You know, maybe I won't let you do this with some of your friends or whatever, but I said, I've got no business walking around here kissing anybody. You know, <laughs> maybe if I hug somebody, shake their hand, you know, something like that. But I knew what I'm talking about. I said, I've got no business. And, and even an adult, if we're not married, you know, uh, we've got no business, in my personal opinion, doing a lot of prolonged affection of whatever it may be, uh -huh. hugging, kissing, whatever it may be. I, I've got no business. They don't belong to me. So uh, I said, it's no different. It reminds me of the dad, uh, you know, his girl was wearing little short shorts and he didn't approve. Right. And so he decided, well, I'm just going to wear little short shorts too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I thought he saw that, so they went out somewhere. So uh, he, you know, they still look the same. And he had his little short shorts on and they were out talking, you know. And, and she was very embarrassed. But he was telling her a lesson. You know, hey, if, 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 if you think you look good in your little short shorts, and, and then, then I'm going to wear a little short shorts too, and we're going to try to think I love you, and then you're going to always think I'm mercy. You know, sometimes we need to think a little bit about what we're doing, the lifestyle we're living, and maybe think, well, that doesn't apply to me. You know, that, that's great. That doesn't apply to me, though. Um, Because their hearts rebellious and, and, and their hearts not right. 
used to many, many, many years ago within liturgy and synagogues, they actually used to declare the Ten Commandments every Shabbat. And we would do that too in Hebrew and then in English. And, uh, you know, just because of limited times and things, we, we, we haven't done it in a little while on Shabbat mornings. <laughs> but overall, in a lot of the synagogues, they took it out because they felt like that, uh, they felt like, well, what if people think that's all there is? That's their only obligation is to do this ten and that's it. And, you know, you're right. You better pull that out of there because people are going to think that's all they have to do. So that was part of the reasoning of, uh, uh, from what I've studied of why they pulled it back because they were afraid people were thinking that they, well, there's a lot of other things too God said to do. And, and if we don't mention all of them, then people are going to think, you know. So it was an interesting thought of why they, you know, decided to pull it out. Uh, there's always, if you look at the history or the root of why people do something or why they don't do something, it's really pretty interesting. And sometimes it's even pretty crazy. You know, uh, uh, sometimes where pra certain practices come from. Sometimes we practice things and we think they're so uh, holy and righteous and if we really looked at the root of it, we may find it, it has nothing to do with what we thought it did. And so sometimes, you know, uh, we, we might have been lied to. Every place is, is full of different practices. Some good, maybe some not so good. You know, at times I even question uh, even, even in a place like this, no matter what, what kind of religious place I've ever been to, there's always some kind of a tradition involved with their services. And traditions aren't bad, but uh, I think it's good to distinguish. I was, I was talking to some people the other day. Uh, traditions can be beautiful, but make sure we let people know this is a tradition. Speak of it as a tradition. Don't speak of it as something like, blessed are you, Lord, who's commanded me to do this. Uh, blessed are you, Lord, who, who's commanded me to, uh, to say the Shema every day, especially on Shabbat. Oh, really? God commanded you to do that? Yeah. Uh, and, and, oh, okay. And uh, I, didn't, I never read that. Yeah, well, that's okay. You know, I, I, you get into a certain pattern where they, God's commanded me to do this and do that. And he's probably looking down saying, I don't remember that one. Uh, Angel Gabriel, I don't remember that one. I don't either. Uh, <laughs> you know, so tradition can be beautiful, but let's distinguish. You know, this is a this is a beautiful tradition. This is why we do it. Oh, okay, that's wonderful. You know, don't be going around and saying, "Bless you, Lord God, who's commanded me to do this." When He, in no way, has commanded you to do it. So, uh, you know, especially if a, a young person comes in, they don't know what they they're unlearned, and they'll make them. I don't won't read the book. They'll just follow the, the they'll just follow what everybody else is doing. I don't know if you've seen that happen in a lot of places. Oh, even. Yeah. Read the book. That's old. You know, that's old fashioned. You know, I, I've read this stuff that is over the flow. Yeah, but one of the flows go the wrong way. Well, I, 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 I'm too lazy to read. You know, uh, you know, this we live in modern technology. Read a book. What you know? And I used to in churches, everybody go, okay, open your Bible. Okay, everybody have their Bibles. In today's society, hardly anybody brings a Bible. You know, it's up on the screen or you've got your computer your iPhone. We live in a different day. And in some ways it's good, but in some ways it's not so good. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. <coughs> All the older people said. <laughs> the older people. <laughs> Here there's a lot of different things also within this Torah portion in, in Deuteronomy 6. It talks about what we would call the Shema. Some call it a prayer. I don't really, my personal uh, take on it, I, I don't really view it as a prayer, but it, it is an important reminder uh, to love God, to, to express our love to Him. And really loving God and loving our neighbor, that's the whole summary, just like we had read this morning, I didn't want to do that, but it's kind of a summary of the whole Torah and the prophets when we really, uh, we have that heart, that love of God in our heart and it's being expressed. And, you know, really, I believe that's the channel. Uh, the, the, the commandments, in a way, are, are kind of channels to express God's love. And if God's love's not there, then, then, then I, it's, it's just not really functioning like it should. Even the gifts of the Spirit there, 1 Corinthians, it talks about in uh, chapter 12, chapter 14. Well, guess what's right in the middle of those two chapters? Chapter 13 is about love, charity. 
And then it goes on to say these gifts without love or nothing. Because those gifts, to me, they're, they're an expression of His love. Yeah. And if we can use those as an expression of uh, those that have been married for a while, you know, there's different ways you express your love to your spouse. I mean, whether it's flowers, chocolate, you know, it's, it's never, you can never go wrong with giving your wife a flower every now and then, unless your wife just is allergic or hates them, you know. And, and there's other things you can do. Yeah, you have to be, no, I hate them. Oh, okay. You don't like that. You You know, some women like children. Some don't. You know, there may be certain things that your wife really likes. Oh, I really like that. That you know, that that, that means something to me. So there's different ways to express our love to even each other, and uh, it varies. There's different ways that we can express our love to God, and even in a biblical way to each other. And so it kind of goes along with the love of God. That should be at the heart of it. Someone had said, well, who are the elect? We had the question last night, you know, the angels, the trumpet's going to sound. The angels from the four quarters are going to come and, and grab hold of God's elect. And uh, maybe it's those that are really connected with the love of God and learn how to express that. And... You know, love, it, 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 it was the heart here in Deuteronomy 6 that, that they expressed their love for him with all their heart, all their soul, just all of their strength. And, and he was their God. He was their mighty one. And, and uh, a lot of different things being said there, they were to communicate that, to write it on their doorpost, to, to, between their eyes, when they were going, when they were lying down, to, just to, to a reminder of that. One of the unique things about them in their day and season was it was kind of something that they had to work on. If it was something that they that was there, they knew about it. The Bible says in Romans that the love of God has been put into our heart by the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't really say that in the Torah of, of Israel. I think this was something unique for God's people because really when we receive salvation, when we receive Yeshua, who was really God's expression of God's love, God so loved the world that He gave, and we receive that expression of His love, Him giving of Himself, uh, th th we receive that love, and it kind of gives us that power to express our love back to Him in, in all the different ways that, that we read about. And uh, through, through the, the Mishpatim, the Kokim, the, the, the Mitzvah, all the different things, um, I'm going to open it up to a, is it that late? Where does time go? Um, I was going to just ask if anybody had a statement or a question, but I, I, I want to give you just one little analogy and then I'll do that. I don't want to keep you too long. I know we've got another service coming up here. Uh, just a lot of different things. Rabbi had asked me to fix this door because it was broken. And so I, I came up here this week and, and I fixed it. And, and I told him, though, that door locks real easy. Mm -hmm. and so we, and actually last night it ended up locking. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just barely brush up against it before it was broken so we could kind of... Uh, so uh, sure enough, you know, I guess somehow God brushed it off. And I thought, well, we need to get in there for this morning service. Bobby's amplifier's in there. Mm -hmm. uh, before I forget, your crock pot's in there, Sister Chris. Uh, I said in there. There were some other things, you know, that were in there. So I'm like, great, you know, we don't have a key. Mm. And last night, me and Scott and his brother Stephen, we were working on the door. We took all the hinges out, and, and uh, his brother Steve's a big old guy. He was he was uh, hitting his shoulder against it because I guess he thought that helped. And I had already tried a little bit. And, and so Scott, we had a good pair of scissors I found in my glove box when we were in there. So finally, we finally got it open. Yeah. And it took a lot of effort. And uh, I was afraid after I fixed it, we were going to have to break it again. Mm. You know, what if you had a key? All that trouble, and my hands got all dirty. Yeah. Just ain't that all dressed nice, and my hands got all dirty. You know, I'm usually I don't dress like this. I, I dress in jeans and t-shirt. You know, sometimes on the weekend for Shabbat, but I was right before I even leave the house, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm already dirty. I just I haven't even done anything yet. I like dressing nice, but it, it, it's hard to keep it. I don't know, especially if you've got kids and animals and all kind of things. You know, I, 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 I just put this on and I'm already dirty. I can't believe it. Anyway, so I, I'm here. Actually, a uh, uh, short story a couple of years ago was uh, 
either Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur, you know, dressed all in white. We were going home, it was a rainstorm. We had a double flat. And uh, we hit a pothole, and, and on that side, both the tires blew out. And so we're here all dressed in our white green clothes. You know, it's raining, it's mud. It's like, oh, great, this is, uh, this is real nice. Anyway, you know, if we would have had a key, we could have opened that door without having to go through all that trouble. We went through a lot of trouble and finally got the door open, but if we would have had a key, it would have made it a lot easier. You know, trying to keep all the laws and the rules and regulations, sometimes it can be a lot of trouble. It can get your hands dirty. You know, when you've got the love of God, which is kind of like that key, it, it, it just kind of helps everything to fall into place. When we've got our heart right, when we've got the love of God filling our heart, then it's not going to be a burden for us. It's just going to be like, I, I just want to love God and how I can see fit to express it. And if some of it may come from these rules. Some of it may just be come from whatever God puts in my hand today. You know, uh, uh, you know, little thing. Giving some a uh, homeless person a dollar, giving them a drink, whatever it may be, helping someone with just something, you know, a little expression of, you know, it may not, sometimes it may not be just, oh, some of these things that we read about, that these are definitely good guidelines, but it doesn't stop here. Well, that's it. I've done my part. Okay. You ever done that? We can give the kids chores. Okay, I've done. We keep, we keep hinting. There's a lot more that needs to be done. Do you think you can look around and maybe think of other things you can do to contribute to the family? Be careful. Okay, I'm not coveting. Okay, I'm not lying. Okay, I'm not stealing. I'm good. It's great. You think you can do some more money to contribute to the kingdom of heaven? That's good. Well, I'm doing my part. That's great. But there's more that we can all be doing. Yes. Oh, I'm not using God's name in vain. It's great, but there's more that you can be doing. We live in a season that, that, yes, we need to follow God's words, but it doesn't stop there. I, I believe there's more every day that we can be doing. And I believe that when the love of God fills our hearts, we're not just trying to follow the rules. The, the rules actually are following us. The, the, the rules in a way where I, if I'm driving around in my car, I don't fear getting pulled over because I've got everything right. I've got my insurance, I've got my tags, I've got my license, I try to obey the law because I just know it's the right thing to do. So I'm not driving around in fear of thinking, oh my gosh, speed limit, oh my gosh, I, I, you know, I don't do that. And we shouldn't either. Oh my gosh, it's the Sabbath, I better, oh my gosh, I don't lie. Okay, this is going to be hard. Don't cut it all. I sure do like the way that looks. Don't cut it, don't cut it. You know, uh, you know I don't do that. <laughs> you know, when the heart's right, it just, the lifestyle is right. Sometimes we are focusing on people's lifestyle and feeding them over the head. Get right, you old sinner. Sometimes even with ourselves, get right, you old sinner, you. <laughs> but sometimes the issue is more in the heart. Yeah. And then when that heart gets right, everything else sometimes falls into place. Sometimes we may need to hit a few folks. So, uh, uh, you know. All right. You ever done that? You ever had a Bible, Bible thumper? Uh, somebody get hit with a Bible? Good. <laughs> Years ago, this Bible college I was part of, the, the president of the Bible college said he, he wanted somebody to get saved so desperately that he started beating them up. He said he started punching them. He said, you know, you need to get saved right now. And he said the person finally surrendered and, and gave their life to the Lord because they didn't want to get hit anymore. <laughs> he kind of wondered if that was genuine. You know, uh, somebody said, that you know, question last time, I'm really desperate for my family to get saved. He said, well, you know, I was thinking of this. I know this isn't kosher, but I was thinking, well, you take a gun and you say, you either get saved now or, you know, that's what that's how the crusader did. It wasn't right or, or, you know, some crazy thing. But, you know, you want to be genuine. You know, if you've ever been on a crusade where you're trying to get people saved, uh, evangelistic meeting, and some people just say, oh, yeah, just, to, just so that you'll leave them alone. But it wasn't genuine. Their heart still wasn't right. They might have said, word, yes, yes, Jesus, or whatever. Yes, Jesus is Lord. Yes, 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 whatever it is they said. And you're like, yes, I did it. And, and, and they're thinking, oh, brother, get that crazy person away from me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we would always pray, Mom, give me some genuine people. And may it be a genuine conversion, something yeah. that's real, not just, okay, I did it. Oh, good for you. 
know, and good for you, you know, you get a star. How many of you win? Twenty. Wow, you're awesome, you know. Uh, you know <laughs> they say statistics that a lot of people supposedly that get saved, they check upon them later and they really weren't really saved when they look at them later. Because sometimes they're in their lifetime and where they're at, you know, it, it didn't take one though. Maybe they they, you know, God, many are called, but few are chosen. All right, we're going to get ready to close out. To live is Messiah. To die is gain. To live is Messiah. To die is gain. Amen. You know, if you come here with Shabbat words, I'm going to try to teach you the truth. And sometimes it's going to be rough. I'm not going to say God's going to give you everything you want. And, he, and he's going to bless you with a brand new car and a brand new job. God can do that. There's not always what's best. I was thinking, you know, I was thinking about, about the idea of being persecuted. The 12 closest Talmudim, the followers of Yeshua, gave their lives for their faith. <coughs> Yeshua, the founder, foundation, Messiah. Well, how long did he preach? Not very long, and then he, he died. He could have prevented it. You know, when God protects his own, he does, if, if there's a need for it. There's people that die for their faith every day. Mm. Oh, you know, God protect me. He might. But what's more important? Just for you to be protected or for you to stand? You know, I, I, in my heart, in my, the above God's will in my heart, I, 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 I'm ready. When I say I'm ready, what am I saying? Well, I'm ready to be blessed. I'm ready to get one of those bumper stickers that say, uh, used to in the, in the day, people would get this bumper sticker and it said something like, uh, blessings coming unto me or something, you know, some crazy thing like that, you know, prosperity day. Uh, whatever I, you know, claim it and, and uh, grab it and grab it, claim it and, you know, all, all these different ideas and, you know, we're, we're the king's kids and we deserve the best. And, you know, there was a movement going on in this time of mentality. Can you imagine the early apostles believing that? Oh, we're, 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 we're the best. God chose us as well. You know, nothing's going to ever bad happen to us. You know, and even the one they didn't kill, Yohanan, John, they tried. They just didn't work on him. He was just a tough old guy, I guess, you know. Yeah, I love that. Uh, they, well, they tried all kinds of things to take him, but they couldn't. What are we going to do? They try to come take us. Kick, scream, yell. You know, I, uh, a couple of weeks ago I talked about this, the five things that the Holy Fist bump, remember that? One of the things was praise. A lot of the people, the martyrs, they were dying, they were offering praise to God. Whoa. What is the purpose of our life? Just to say, I'm blessed. You ever hear people, hi, how are you doing? Blessed. Bless. You know, if you're, you know, if you're blessed, that's great. But you ever kind of sense something in your spirit, and you're like, you know, it's almost whether that's a, a, a pride or whether it's you can kind of tell the person's like just saying because they're hoping that maybe that's a confession of faith, maybe it'll happen to them or something. No, <laughs> no, no, I haven't had that happen in a long time. We, we've had certain people that that'd be their, their, their standard answer. And just bear with me, and that's how you answer. I'm not saying that's a bad thing necessarily. But you know, it shouldn't be honest with each other. How are you doing? Blessed. You know, uh, uh, the Bible does say we're blessed. But at the same time, be real with each other, yeah. you know. Yeah. If you're hurting or, or you're having a hard time, don't feel like you got to say, I'm glad. You know, uh, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. You know, uh, maybe you've got a headache. Oh, that's a negative confession. Yeah. Well, you know what? If it's real and it's hurting, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying it. You know what? My head hurts. You know? It doesn't really. I'm just saying, you know, it did. Then we got nothing wrong with that, you know. Uh, we need to be real with each other. You know, that I think sometimes we've we got a bunch of fake people running around yeah. in these little uh, believing bubbles, whether it be a Christian bubble or a Messianic bubble. <laughs> I want, you, want you to know that in these days, God's going to be popping some bubbles. Uh, and he may be putting us into some uncomfortable positions. Because I believe he says this little bubble life it needs to come to an end. Uh, Our little bubble world. Oh, I just want... You know, I just want to be in my little protective bubble, you know, uh, you know, and, and uh, is that what he said? All right, I'm 
given you the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you go build yourselves in bubbles to protect yourselves. And don't ever, uh, don't ever communicate with anybody because they may contaminate you. And, uh, and there's a lot of crazies out there, so try to stay in your little box churches as long as you can. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I mean, sometimes the mentality that we have is really opposite of what he said. Uh-huh. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Yeah, some of those creatures are ugly dogs. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>